So I frequently get asked questions about inverters, in particular inexpensive inverters like these that you find on Amazon, uh, eBay, and other discount retailers. And probably the number one question I get asked is about grounding them and bonding the neutral to the ground. So as far as grounding them, the best thing to do is refer to the manual for them. And typically if they can be grounded, They'll have a uh, grounding lug on the case, like this one, and this one has one. These two here don't provide that. Um, as far as tying the neutral to the ground or bonding them, um, for the most part, these inverters don't allow that. Um, the only ones that will is if they have a floating ground or if they're already internally bonded. And the reason for that, I'll explain later in this video, and it'll reveal something about these inverters that you probably don't know, and those that do really haven't uh, talked about it much. So before we get to that, let me talk about another question I get asked a lot is the difference between a modified sine wave and a pure sine wave inverter. Well, a pure sine wave inverter is just like the power you have at home or what you get from a generator. It's in a sine wave as the name would apply and so for half the cycle the voltage ramps up positive and the other half it goes negative. Now with a modified sine wave inverter it's not really a sine wave at all. For the first half the inverter will switch to a positive voltage for a portion of the cycle and then for the second half of that cycle it will switch to a negative voltage for a portion of it. So the timing of it is so that it mimics or is roughly equal to the voltage you would get with a, a true sine wave. So the next question is which inverter do we need? A modified sine wave or a pure sine wave inverter? So with a modified sine wave there's some issues with it and some advantages. The advantage is they're not as expensive as a pure sine wave inverter. The disadvantage is there are some things that won't work with it. Um, I found a lot of battery chargers, especially for like cordless tools, and even some battery chargers for, for regular 12-volt uh, deep cycle batteries or even uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries, that they won't work off of it. Um, the other thing I've found is some smaller uh, items like uh, electric shavers for example may not work on it. Now I've heard some reports that a modified sine wave inverter can damage them. I have not personally experienced that but I suppose it could be true. The other thing you'll find with a uh, modified sine wave is they're not as efficient as a pure sine wave. So although it says modified sine wave, it's actually square waves and with that you get a lot of harmonics and that can add to or lead to a lot of power loss um, especially when you're dealing with induction type motors. Another thing I have encountered is synchronous motors like uh, a lot of your uh, desktop fans, oscillating fans, those type things use um, they'll be kind of noisy you hear a little bit of a hum in them where you wouldn't normally hear that with a pure sine wave inverter there again it's the harmonics that are causing that issue um, with that said this uh, inverter here which is a modified sine wave a 1500 watt inverter I have had for probably 20-25 years and I originally had it in a uh, travel trailer where I replaced a lot of the appliances and all the lighting and everything with 120 volt lighting and I never had any issues with it. Since then I've kept the inverter around where uh, whenever we have a power blackout I can use it with a deep cycle battery to back up my refrigerator and it'll so it'll run a re residential refrigerator just fine. I've never had any issues with it. So if you're getting ready to add an inverter to an RV or say your camper van I would go with the, the pure sine wave inverter because then you don't have to worry about uh, particular devices that you might get later on whether they'll work with it or not. So the pure sine wave inverters are more expensive in some cases as much as twice the price 
but it's definitely worth the money because say in a new RV or camper van, you don't have to worry about any future uh, items you wanna power off of it because it will generally work them. Okay, now another question I get asked is what size inverter do I need? So that all depends on your load um, and the type of load, but generally, I recommend for anybody with an RV or a like camper van to go with a minimum of a 2000 watt inverter and uh, ultimately I prefer to go with at least a 3000 watt inverter. So actually a 2000 watt inverter can run just about anything even a rooftop air provided it has a soft start and if you're wanting to use these to power a rooftop unit even a 3000 watt inverter you'll want a soft start because they typically will fault out before they'll get uh, the inrush of a rooftop unit uh, started up. So now with the Omnia vans that I build I actually include two inverters in them. So I have the primary which is the 3000 watt inverter and that's built into a package I call the APU or auxiliary power unit. So that APU package is the inverter, uh, battery cells, the uh, AC charger for when you hook to shore power. It also has a solar charge controller in it. Plus there's additional electronics that monitors everything like temperatures and loads and everything. And that uh, connects to the rest of the van electronics through a system called PCAN, which is a, a uh, CAN bus system. So the second inverter I use in the Omnia van build is the V inverter. Now it's connected directly to the battery in the, in the van. So it runs off the van's electrical system, but it only runs when the engine is running and is, uh, the alternator is putting out, got the voltage up to a safe, usable level. Um, so the, the neat thing about that is whenever you're driving the van or you just have it running, um, all your 120 volt loads can run through that inverter. It also will uh, charge the lithium iron phosphate battery, the primary battery in the uh, APU uh, through the shore power charger. So in that case, I don't use a DC to DC charger. It's all done through the V inverter and through a shore power type uh, charging system. Okay, then another question along the lines of uh, inverter size is the battery bank size. So essentially the larger the inverter, then the larger battery capacity you'll probably need. Um, I recommend at a minimum, whatever the wattage of your inverter is, to have at least that in watt hours in your battery pack. Now that's with a lithium iron phosphate battery. If you're using uh, lead acid or AGM style batteries, then you'll probably wanna bump that up by about 20%. Now that's a minimum as far as a maximum. That all depends on uh, how much of a load you're planning on having over a period of time uh, to determine the uh, capacity of your batteries that you're gonna want. Now the flip side to that, the larger the battery bank you have, you got to think about how are you going to recharge those batteries. So if you're going to be out for a period of time, and for example, let's say you want to run a air conditioner, you, you can do it. You, know, you might be able to get through the night, but then your batteries get depleted. How do you get them recharged? So you got to look at a secondary charging system, such as uh, using through the alternator, or in the case of the Omnia van, it uses the V inverter to recharge. Or you can have a second alternator set up where you can do a faster charge of your, your batteries, which when you get to a really large battery bank, that's the kind of option you really would have to go with. Okay, so now let's talk about the dirty little secret about these inexpensive inverters I have here. Okay, they're not 120 volt single phase inverters they're actually 60 volt split phase inverters. So what is a 60 volt split phase inverter? So with a split phase inverter, you have two legs, one that's at 60 volts 
and the other one that's at 60 volts with respect to ground. But they're out of phase, so when you go across the two legs, you get 120 volts. This is similar to the power coming into your home, where you have two 120 volt legs, and when you go across the two legs, because they're out of phase, you get 240 volts. So with the split phase inverter, they're connecting the one hot leg to the neutral line. So this means your neutral is actually at a 60 volt AC with respect to the ground. So with a single phase inverter, you'll have 120 volts AC on the hot leg and the neutral leg will be at ground potential. So why is that or why do they do that? Well, it comes down to economics is it's cheaper to build a 60 volt split phase inverter than it is a 120 volt inverter. So is there an issue with that? Well, there could be the thought of actually having 60 volts on the neutral line. Technically, it's no longer a neutral line. It's uh, you got two hot legs. The only issue I can really think of offhand is anything where you're going to come in contact with that neutral leg, which really most devices you should not. The only thing I can think of is some of your older lamps where you have the screw in bulbs. Let's say if you had your inverter on and you're unscrewing the bulb and you come in contact with the, the base of the bulb, you could get shocked. I can't really think of any other scenarios, but the, the thing with it is, is there's no way you can bond the neutral ground because your neutral on that inverter is actually a 60 volt AC leg with respect to ground. Okay, so if that's a concern for you, I would recommend going to a higher quality inverter such as the Victron MultiPlus series inverters. So they, they're going to be a little more expensive, but they offer a lot of features. And actually the features they offer for the price is really a bargain. One of the things is they'll have a built-in battery charger built into the inverter. The other is that they can supplement your shore power coming in with the inverter power. Plus you can limit the incoming shore power to whatever level you set it for. So for example, if you're hooked to a 30 amp RV outlet and you can uh, allow it to draw up to 30 amps, but let's say you're now connected just to a 20 or 15 amp outlet. So you can dial down the current limit that you want your allowed to pull from your shore power. But you can still use um, power greater than that shore power and what it does is it'll supplement that shore power using the uh, inverter in it. And on the flip side uh, whenever you're not using the full amount, then it can use that amount of power to recharge your battery. So for example, let's say you have it, a limit of 20 amps coming in and you're using 15 amps. Well, now it can use uh, 5 amps to be recharging your batteries so that you're not exceeding the, the 20 amp input limit. So a lot of features uh, and plus some others that you'd have to look at that I'm not going into in this detail in this video. So the next thing we need to talk about is how do we determine if you, these inverters are a split phase or if they have a floating ground. And unfortunately in the documentations I have never seen anything in any of these inverters that tell you that it's a split phase inverter versus a single phase inverter. So Here's the step I use to determine if it's a split phase or a single phase inverter. Okay, so I've connected this inverter to a deep cycle 12 volt battery. And I also have it hooked through this uh, temporary wiring to an incandescent bulb so that we can do some testing. What I want to do is I'm going to do a test to see if we can bond the neutral to ground. And we'll also determine whether this has a floating ground or if it's already bonded or if it's a split phase inverter. So with it connected like this, I've got the light connected between the neutral and the hot. 
I turn the inverter on and our light bulb comes on. I'm going to hook our probes on our multimeter. Let's get that on. And let's put it on AC voltage scale. And I'm showing 116 volts from the neutral to the hot side. Okay, I'm going to turn this off. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to swap the lead here where I'm going to go from neutral to the ground leg. When I turn the inverter on, our light bulb doesn't light up. And our inverter is faulted out, so it's now from the hot to neutral, it's only putting out zero volts. So it's detecting a, it's detecting a ground fault from the neutral to the ground. So that right there tells me we can't we can't bond the neutral to the ground. Um, but it doesn't mean it's not internally bonded. So just one other test. We're going to go hot leg, hot leg to ground on our light, which that also should just give us a fault condition, which it does. So zero volts out. Okay, so now I'm going to swap this back. So we're, we're testing. Are we got our light bulb back so it's uh connected neutral to hot turn the inverter on it lights up now what i'm going to do is i'm going to take my probe off the neutral so now i'm connected to the hot side and i'm going to check to ground and i have 67 volts ac and if i check from hot to the negative battery cable also have 67 volts AC so now I'm going to check the neutral to ground and I also have 67 volts and 67 volts AC to the negative battery terminal that there confirms to me that this is a 60 volt split phase inverter I hope you enjoyed this video and found it informative. If you have any questions or concerns, please leave them in the comments below. I will try to respond to them as soon as I can. Thanks for watching.